Today we're going to be talking about. Desire in film. The idea of desire is connected with the birth of cinema. The origin of film, of course, is when uh, people started to have the idea that if you put images that closely follow one after the other, you put them together and you go through them very quickly, it will look like the image is moving. Uh, basically, this is how they do animation today. So that's the origin of cinema. <clears throat> so basically it started off with pictures. Now, what can you do with pictures? Turns out you can do a lot of things. One thing somebody thought to do was to use these so-called moving pictures, the original name for film, uh, to put on a peep show. Now, a peep show originally, peep means to uh, secretly look uh, tokui. So a peep show originally was, uh, for example, in a carnival, there would be a tent for adults only, and you could pay the man at the front door some money. He would give you a ticket. You could go in and you could look at, for example, a naked woman or something. Uh, so it's already uh, connected with the idea of looking, secretly looking through. Uh, usually it's a small space. Um, and so after somebody uh, realized we don't have to actually pay the woman, we can just take pictures and make them look like they're moving and we can still charge money for this entertainment. Uh, and so that's one of the original sources of the cinema. The cinema also had many other sources, children's toys, scientific pictures, but this is one of them and also one of the most popular. <clears throat> um, but even if we don't use the camera or a viewfinder to look at naked women or pictures of naked women, the idea of looking through a camera at something is still quite voyeuristic. Uh, it's, it's kind of like looking through a keyhole or looking through a window at somebody or something. Um, and this is also one of the original ideas of the cinema. If you look around you in the real world, you can see everything that your eye can see. Your eye has a very wide range of vision. A camera, on the other hand, usually is more limited. And we've talked before about how you are only limited to what you see on screen. You are only limited to what you can see through the camera. In other words, there is this kind of tension between what you can see and what you can't see because it's just outside of the picture. It's like uh, someone looking at uh, someone looking through a person's window and only being able to see what the window lets you see. Uh, if the window doesn't show you the next room, you can't see the next room. Um, so it's a similar kind of visual logic. And so uh, this is also why in movies, actors usually don't look into the camera. They usually don't look at you. Because if you're a voyeur and you're looking through somebody's window, why did the automatic caption censor the word voyeur? V O Y E U R. Right. Uh, so if you're looking through somebody's window and they suddenly look back through the window at you, it it shakes you out of the position of being an audience member. It drags you out of the story or the event or the person or thing that you're looking at. Suddenly you realize that you are the person looking. You realize that you are not outside the story, not just an audience member, you are part of the story. The person you are looking at can suddenly see you and react to you. 
Now in certain controlled settings, this is quite exciting. We've seen two uh, Kristen Stewart movies that have ended with Kristen Stewart looking into the camera at the end of Underwater and at the end of Personal Shopper. That brief moment gives the audience a, a sense of shock and it draws the audience into the story. Or think about when you go see a live performance, like a play on stage. Part of the excitement of a live performance is you know that you and the actors are in the same space. You know that they are affected by anything you do that will catch their attention. If you shout too loudly, if you create a disturbance, they are affected and so you are all part of the same story. That's part of the excitement. But, <laughs> but of course, when you watch a play, uh, you're not looking through a window, right? You're both in the same room. You both know what's going on. Uh, and that's different for cinema. Even when, and that's, and that's why when an actor looks at the camera, looks at you through the camera, back at you through the camera, it's exciting because you don't expect it. You're not supposed to be in the same space in the same story. <clears throat> um, so if looking at uh, something going on on screen through the camera itself, it is is kind of like secretly looking at somebody else. Already there is desire in this logic. And so uh, many filmmakers have used this relationship to create desire for the audience. Most of cinema history, films have been made for men to watch and to enjoy. Uh, this idea is known as the male gaze. Gaze is ning uh, shi. And the idea is <clears throat> for most films, the men you see on screen uh, are meant to be identified with. You're supposed to think that you agree with this person. You can empathize with this man. Whereas the women on screen are usually treated as objects. Uh, people that you would react to, but you don't really care about how they feel or what they think. They are merely just like another object in the world of the story. Now this is not true for all films. And there have been certain periods in cinema history where this has been less true. But even today, if you go uh, walk into a random movie theater, most movies will be shot using the male gaze. Uh, and so feminism in the cinema is a big issue. We think about movies like adventure movies, action movies, fantasy movies. How many of those movies are from the perspective of the woman and not just from the perspective of the woman, but the way that the movie presents its men and women presents its world, lets you identify with the women and gets you thinking about the women characters, what they think, how they feel, and not just the men. Uh, in recent years, this has improved uh, with the awareness that this is a problem. Um, but still, most movie studios are in the business to make money, and the assumption still is that men watch more movies than women. It's not necessarily true. There have been a number of uh, films that do not use the male gaze in recent years that have made lots of money, but most movie studios uh, executives uh, are still very stuck in the older way of thinking. But regardless of whether a movie uses the male gaze or the female gaze or something more objective, perhaps like a documentary, the experience of walking into a movie theater, looking at this huge screen and all the people on the screen inherently uh, gives the people on screen a sense of desire. We don't go to the movies to watch people like us, regular people like you and me. We go to the movies to watch people who are more beautiful than us, more handsome than us, who wear better clothes than we do, who live a better life than we do. And this logic is embedded specifically 
in the idea of a story. We seldom see a movie where characters behave like people do in real life. In real life, when you talk, you don't say complete sentence after complete sentence, right? Sometimes you stop, you think, you interrupt yourself, you interrupt other people, you forget what you're saying, you you screw up your words, you have to restate what you're saying. Very rarely when you talk is everything completely clearly set out like in a line of movie dialogue. The same goes for most other aspects of film stories as well. Uh, in a story, when you need something to happen, it happens just like that. Or if uh, you need some kind of surprise, you can design a surprise. Uh, characters often play roles that are more clear than in real life. You usually know who the good guy is, who the bad guy is, these kinds of ideas. All of these aspects of movie storytelling are unrealistic. Movies themselves are a kind of fantasy, even if you're not watching a fantasy movie. And so when we watch a movie, the experience itself is full of desire. Uh, in the past, or well, I guess even today, uh, people read novels uh, about situations that are unrealistic as a kind of escapism or a kind of uh, fantasy or entertainment. Movies are similar, or rather most movies are similar. Uh, and they're even more powerful than novels because we don't have to imagine things ourselves. When you read a novel, uh, some people's imaginations focus more on the story. Some people focus more on the setting, like where the story takes place. Some people's imaginations are better at giving a picture of the characters. But very few people can imagine everything that they read in a novel. But if you watch a movie, you don't have to imagine. Everything you need to see or know is put on the screen for you. So we don't need to depend on our vague and unreliable imaginations. We can directly take in what is presented to us, and we have a direct emotional connection to the characters and to what's going on in the story. So Desire is an inherent part of the cinema. Uh, going to watch these movie stars do fantastical things, we already feel this kind of fantasy, unrealistic desire to be like them or to live in that kind of world. But of course, when we talk about desire, we usually are thinking about sexual desire. Uh, when we say that actors exude charisma or give off desire, part of that is sexual, yes, but not all of it. Uh, usually the idea of sexual desire comes out in romances or movies that have like sex scenes or that uh, deliberately present male and female actors as having some kind of romantic chemistry or romantic tension. Even if there is no sex, there's no actual uh, confirmation of a romantic relationship. For example, think about Constantine, right? Um, between the leading man, John Constantine, and uh, the woman played by uh, Rachel Weiss. Uh, there are a couple of scenes where it looks like they're about to kiss. Uh, but in one, Constantine is opening a car door for her, and the other, she is uh, giving him, or no, he is giving her the sword, a spear of destiny or something, and putting it in her pocket or something like that. So, like, merely the fact, look, they're not in a romantic relationship. Nothing about their relationship tells us that they are going to fall in love or have sex or anything. So, why are we? tricked into thinking that they might kiss. Very simple. The man is handsome. The woman is beautiful. Their faces are close and the camera. Focuses the image 
very tightly on those faces very closely. When we have that kind of image, when we have that kind of scene, we automatically expect them to kiss. This is the logic of desire in cinema. Because of the way that the actors are placed relative to each other, because of the way that the image is framed and presented, it creates desire for the audience. So when we actually talk about um, when characters kiss or have sex in a movie, uh, we have to be careful and clear about how we understand what's going on. On the one hand, two people kissing or having sex automatically uh, invokes the idea of sexual desire. On the other hand, how does the movie present this scene? How does the movie present these images? It is possible and in fact is often done intentionally for a movie to present romantic uh, encounters or situations unromantically. To make a kissing scene look disgusting, to make a sex scene look boring. Uh, and this is by doing the opposite of what Constantine did, not focusing <clears throat> tightly on the actors, uh, not directing our attention to what's going on, using a more bland or normal angle instead of a more subjective or involved angle, uh, adding uh, disgusting sounds also that are not sexy, or putting them in a situation where the environment is dirty uh, or that emphasizes uh, how the situation is not uh, like a fantasy. Like when in real life we fall in love and, and we enter into a romantic situation with somebody, we're not dependent on uh, our surroundings, our physical environment. Like, yes, if the physical environment is romantic, that helps. But if you're, uh, if you are full enough of desire or if you are uh, full enough of romantic ideas, the surrounding environment does not matter uh, because the only thing that matters is the other person. But when we're watching a movie, like I just said, we see everything on screen. This also means that we cannot choose to ignore everything on screen. We don't just get more, we have to accept everything. In a novel, if you are not interested in the setting, right? You don't care if, uh, you don't care how the book describes the place or the location or the weather. You can skip those lines. You don't have to read them. But in a movie, uh, everything you see on screen appears to you at the same time. And you can't choose to uh, only see one part. So if the film presents a sex scene in a dirty environment, in a non-sexy angle and in a non-sexy image, we can't just choose to focus only on the, the characters having sex. Uh, we also take in all of the unsexy parts of that scene. So uh, the way that desire and sex is presented on screen is also a very powerful storytelling tool. Um, in recent years, people have been complaining that movies are less and less sexy. There seems to be less sex in movies. There seems to be, uh, when, even when there is sex in movies, it seems to be presented in a less sexy way. Uh, one film critic, Richard Brody from The New Yorker, notes that today most movie sex scenes don't do anything except tell the viewer that these two characters had sex. It's purely information. It doesn't give you an emotion, it doesn't put you in the subjective romantic point of view of a character. It simply says uh, these two fell in love or like these two are started to feel sexual desire. You expect them to have sex. OK, here you go. They had sex. That's it. At its core, this kind of information is very 
uncinematic. This is not something that you need to watch a movie uh, in order to understand, right? People have sex every day around the world. You don't need to to. There's nothing special about this kind of sex scene in a movie. Whereas if you watch older movies specifically focused on uh, characters who maybe aren't in love but do have sexual desire, there are many different ways throughout the history of cinema to present and evoke sexual desire uh, for the audience. In fact, pornography, before it became an internet thing, Pornography was born in the cinema. It used to be considered uh, a kind of film. And I guess again, uh, the captions want to censor uh, the word porn. Uh, the idea of explicit sex in movies. Uh, before the internet, uh, if you wanted to watch porn, you had to go to a special adult film theater and sit in a room with other mostly men in the dark, uh, preferably not next to somebody, right? You want to sit alone and you would watch an entire movie, not just like five, 10 minutes, but an entire 90 minute movie. That's basically just uh, revolves around people having sex on screen. So this was also a part of cinema history. Uh, and. Today, there are people who study the so-called golden age of pornography uh, to examine the different techniques, the different uh, uses of film language that these filmmakers used, not just to present actual sex on screen, but to use that to invoke desire in the audience. Um, so there have been uh, some possible explanations for why movies today have gotten less and less sexy. Uh, one perhaps is because uh, pornography has moved to the internet. So se uh, films, movies, and porn have become separated into two different kinds of, let's say, entertainment. Another reason could be that uh, maybe today people care more about TV shows. And indeed, if you look at American TV shows today, uh, they have more sex than they used to. Just think about Game of Thrones, finger holds ago, lots of sex. And so perhaps uh, this theory says people who go to want used to go to watch movies for like direct visceral emotional entertainment now mostly watch TV shows instead. Uh, a third theory says that maybe this is one of the effects of Marvel movies. Marvel movies notoriously are not sexy. Uh, they're more about action, adventure, uh, fantasy. I think only once or twice, maybe three times, characters have kissed in a Marvel movie, uh, and there have been no sex scenes. Um, and this makes sense for these kinds of movies. They were based on comic books. The first movie, 2008's Iron Man, was aimed at uh, older children and young adults. Uh, and like especially for older children, they their parents probably wouldn't let them watch a movie that's full of sex, right? Uh, but from 2008 to today, it's been uh, 14 years. The so-called older children who are like 14, 15, 16 are now like 25, uh, almost 30, uh, they're no longer children. So the beginning idea that comic book movies probably shouldn't have a lot of sex makes sense. But as the Marvel Cinematic Universe has grown, as these movies have become more and more influential uh, in terms of uh, giving movie studios an idea of what would make money and so what kind of films they should make, and as Marvel movies have taken up more space at movie theaters at the cost of uh, smaller movies uh, or more artistic movies, uh, movies that were originally from the beginning aimed at adult viewers, not just older children and young adults. Uh, the idea of how much romance and sex a movie should have 
has changed in the culture. As a culture, people have uh, become more used to the, the idea that uh, love and sex, which is an incredibly important part of human experience and human culture, don't have to be in a movie. And it's true, they don't have to be in a movie, but it's probably unhealthy for love and sex to be absent from most movies, especially most movies that ordinary people might uh, hear about and want to watch. Uh, and by ordinary people, I mean people who don't look for art movies or small movies, indie movies, uh, movies that are not playing in every theater. So the change of how a culture views desire in the movies also has a bigger influence on the culture in general. So when we talk about desire in movies, just to sum up, yes, we're talking about love and sexual desire, but it's not just about is this erotic or not. It's also about what kind of influence uh, does this portrayal of love and sex have on movies, on, on this movie, on movies in general, on the culture. It's also about uh, how the filmmaker uses filmmaking language and techniques to uh, enhance or uh, weaken the desire of a scene. And it's also about respecting and acknowledging that desire has always been and will always be part of cinema, cinema history, and the logic of the cinema. Uh, so even when we watch a movie that's not sexy, you can think about why not? Why does this movie choose not to tell a story about this fundamental aspect of human experience uh, and human history and culture? OK. Do you have questions about desire in cinema? OK, so today we're watching a film noir. What is a film noir? First of all, in Chinese is uh, Hei Se Ding. This term came from French and it basically just means black film. Why? Well, what is a film noir? First of all, a film noir is a, a film that has elements related to uh, secrets, betrayal, uh, like a dark, untrustworthy environment. You don't know who you can trust. Uh, and a protagonist who is not exactly a hero, but he's probably better than, and it's usually a man, He's probably better than most other characters in this story. He's usually some kind of detective or someone who's trying to figure out the truth about something like a conspiracy. Uh, and at the end, usually either he does not discover the truth or he discovers the truth, but realizes that he cannot change anything. He cannot improve anything. Or he discovers the truth and he dies or becomes part of the problem. In other words, it's a movie that uh, reacts against the traditional storytelling idea that good, the world is good, our hero is good, and the problems are always solved by the end of the story. So that's one reason why this kind of film has been described as black. Uh, but there are other reasons. Uh, why had this kind of movie uh, originated? It was uh, film noir first originated in the late 30s er, uh, and throughout the 40s and 50s. What was going on in the world at that time? World War II. And what was so interesting about World War II is it's not like a traditional war before then, where like two countries disagreed and the negotiations failed and so they fought each other. World War II was started by a dude who had a vision for the whole world, an ideology that only like white German people should be in power and everybody else uh, who is not white should be killed and everybody who is white should have to follow the Germans. 
the Nazis. I'm talking about the Nazis. So it's not just like uh, we disagree over this uh, piece of land or this city. Um, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler tried to change the logic of how societies work around the world. In other words, uh, it the idea, the mere idea that somebody had this idea for the world, wanted to change the world in this way, shook the foundations of Western society. And it disrupted the original idea or the traditional idea that uh, if we could all just get along and agree to disagree, we won't have to have war. We don't have to have violence because some ideas you cannot compromise with. You cannot negotiate with. And so uh, when Western society is revealed to not be uh, founded on universal values, when it has, it has been revealed that some people in your society might want a completely different society that would be very harmful and dangerous for many people. Uh, people started losing trust in the idea of a harmonious society. And that is reflected in the movies. Before film noir, most, as I was saying, most movies are set in a world where most people are good. Only some people are bad and the good guys always win at the end. Most movies. But film noir turns that on its head. It's the complete opposite. In the world of a film noir, the world is untrustworthy. You can't trust anybody. You can't trust the cops. You can't trust the judges. Uh, you can't really trust uh, even your friends because the movies are about betrayal. And there's a dark secret that nobody wants the protagonist to find out about. And the, when the protagonist does discover and uncover the secret, nothing changes. The good guys don't win. The good uh, parts of society don't win over the bad parts. And the protagonist himself is also usually not a good man. The traditional film noir detective is a hard drinker, uh, is foul mouthed, he's not very polite. Uh, he doesn't respect women, doesn't respect the uh, authority. Um, usually the only way we can tell that the protagonist is not entirely bad is that he usually respects the small guy, the little guy, the worker, the small business owner, people who are struggling in daily life. Uh, and so you can see how um, the way that the film uh, gives political value to different characters, right? Uh, bosses and police are bad. Little guys, workers are good. Also tells you what kind of audience a film noir was aimed at. It was aimed at an audience of people who had lost trust in society, had been through the Great Depression and the beginnings and uh, fighting of World War II, uh, and who felt abandoned and alone, uh, abandoned by their government, abandoned by their community leaders, uh, and had to rely on an imperfect hero to try to figure out a way to solve the problem, but even at the end, uh, the problem cannot be solved. Uh, now, among these characters, usually uh, you would also have a woman who is in incredibly sexy and incredibly untrustworthy. Uh, the name for this kind of character also comes from, from the French. She's called a femme fatale. Uh, in Chinese, zi ming nu ren. So usually this is like the wife of a gangster or like the person who asks the detective to look into a problem or just basically someone who a woman who is sexy and has influence and you can't trust, but you have to work with her or get information out of her anyway. Uh, and uh, as you might imagine, a femme fatale also plays to the male gaze, but because she is untrustworthy, in some ways, she's also a subversion of the male gaze. Remember, the male gaze usually treats women as just another kind of object in the film for the men to interact with, use, and then you don't have to care about their inner life. But for a femme fatale, you do have to care about her inner life, because if you don't understand her 
you might be betrayed by her. She might uh, put you in danger. Uh, so she's a very important character that you can't just ignore. Or that the protagonist cannot just ignore. And so uh, with the uh, birth of feminist views of film, people have started to look back on those femme fatales. They're not just a threat to the men. They also have reasons for what they're doing. Usually a femme fatale uh, is a woman who doesn't have uh, like overt power, like she isn't uh, a powerful. She doesn't have a powerful position in public society, so she's not like a, a leader. She's not like someone with political power. Usually a femme fatale only has power indirectly. Maybe she's married to, like I said, a crime boss. Maybe she's married to the mayor. Uh, or maybe more likely she's probably the mayor's girlfriend, secret girlfriend. Um, so her position also makes her vulnerable and restricted. She can't do what she really wants to do in life. She's usually been given a bad deal. Uh, she's stuck in a patriarchal society that doesn't allow her to fulfill her dreams and passions. And so uh, the reason in many of these films that this woman is so deceitful and untrustworthy is because she's not trying to fit in with any man's plan. She's trying to make space for her own life in a society that does not grant her space. And so, of course, the good guy detective is a man. The bad guy is also usually a man. So the femme fatale is caught in the middle. Uh, and that's why she's such an interesting part of a film noir. What does she want? How much does the film tell you about her? Or do you have to figure it out for yourself? How well does the, the detective understand her? Or is he completely oblivious and therefore vulnerable to her designs? Uh, now, another reason these kinds of movies are called film noir is because in the beginning they were in black and white. Even after the invention of color, film noirs were usually shot in black and white. And the reason is because uh, the setting usually emphasizes a city at night full of shadows, uh, full of dark spaces, secret spaces. Uh, so like around every corner, uh, there might be a bad guy. You don't you can't even trust the space that you are in. And shooting this kind of film in black and white emphasizes this perspective. You're not distracted by colors. You don't really care if this wall or this corner is red or green or blue or yellow. You only care that you can't see around the corner because it's dark and it's in shadow. And that's the most important part. So shooting in black and white also lets the characters use shadow. Uh, if you have color, you might have different kinds of shadow, different shades of shadow. You might have to worry about hair color, clothing color, whether hiding in this place or that place would actually work. But if you shoot in black and white, all you have is lighter and darker. So if a character is lighter than their surroundings and they disappear into the shadows, it's very straightforward. You can't see them. That's it. Uh, and so this is also one reason why the French called this film noir. Now, uh, some of you might be wondering, why is this the only kind of film that uses a French name? Like, yes, France was very important for the history of cinema, but all the other kinds of movies, right? Action, romance, uh, fantasy, horror, all have English names. Why only film noir? And the reason is because the French basically uh, invented the idea of film noir as a kind of film. Yes, most films noir were made in Hollywood, uh, but people didn't really uh, weren't able to conceptualize this as a kind of film. They usually thought of it as like crime or action or like uh, mystery. 
but the French realized that uh, it's not just crime, it's not just action, it's not just mystery. It's all of them put together and combined with this kind of dark, untrustworthy atmosphere. So in fact, it is a unique uh, genre of film. It is itself its own genre. Film noir is also very important to the history of cinema because in France, the people who came up with this idea weren't just like ordinary view, uh, moviegoers. It was a group of film critics writing in a film journal called the Cahier du Cinema in Chinese, Ding Bi Ji. Uh, and most of these critics later on themselves became filmmakers. And the kinds of films that they made were so different from the traditional films that had had been made up to that point that they, these filmmakers, the films that they made were also given their own name. Their kind of film, that genre is called uh, the Nouvelle Vague in uh, Chinese, Xing Lang Cao. Uh, this was in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, so you had people like Jean-Luc Godard, Gao Da, you had uh, Francois Truffaut, Truffaut, the director of Day for Night, if you remember from week one. Um, and based on their knowledge of cinema history and based on the creativity that they saw in popular American movies such as films noir, the new and different ways that filmmakers were using to portray new and different stories, these French directors continued inventing and experimenting, and they changed the possibilities of filmmaking grammar uh, forever. Before the uh, Nouvelle Vogue, most films looked like stage plays. Sorry, stage plays. They looked like um, actors walking around a space saying things to the camera. There was not as much emphasis on editing and camera angles um, and like different kinds of uh, shots and uses of time. Uh, after, this all changed after the Nouvelle Vague. Pe uh, people started playing around with time, uh, using new and inventive camera angles, putting shots together in new, innovative and uh, sometimes striking ways, very daring, uh, even shocking ways of putting images together. Uh, and all of that has filtered down into cinema that we have today. Think about all of the movies you've seen that played around with time. If you've seen the first Doctor Strange, if you haven't seen the first Doctor Strange, I'm going to spoil the ending, sorry. But at the end of the first Doctor Strange, uh, Stephen Strange defeats the uh, incredibly powerful bad guy, not by fighting him, but by repeatedly dying and then coming back and dying and coming back and basically defeats the bad guy by annoying him into agreeing to a deal. That's playing with time, right? Uh, because he has to play with time to come back alive. Uh, he dies and then he, time uh, repeats itself and repeats itself. That idea would not have been taken seriously or filmmakers would not have known how to present that kind of idea in a movie if it were not for the experiments in chronology and editing of the Nouvelle Vague. So basically, the reason we have Doctor Strange is because of film noir. Uh, okay, so that's basically my introduction to film noir. Do you have questions? Okay, today we're watching a film noir from 1996 called Bound. Uh, and this movie is most famous for being the first feature length film shot by the Wachowskis and the Wachowskis are the directors of the Matrix. Um, the most recent Matrix, Haiku uh, Rao, the most recent one was only shot by one of them. They used to work as a team, they're siblings. Uh, they're transgender siblings. Uh, they were born male and later transitioned to women. 
Um, so they used to work together, but recently uh, one of the sisters decided they that she didn't want to make movies anymore. So the recent Matrix movie was made by only one of them. But throughout their career, every single one of their movies has been a spectacle. It has been a delightful visual entertainment. They are so good at creating exciting and innovative and interesting imagery. Even if a lot of their movies like on the level of story aren't you know that good, but you are always interested in what you see on screen. Their first movie, Bound, uh, is a film noir in color, uh, in very good color, very good use of color. And it tells the story of not one femme fatale, but two femme fatale, two women stuck in a bad situation, and they have to lie and cheat and steal their way out of danger. It's also a famous film for portraying lesbian desire. The two women uh, fall in love and they have sex and they have very sexy sex. So it's not, I was just saying there are different ways you can portray sexual desire on screen. This movie portrays sexual desire in a very sexy way. There is a famous scene that has no sex. There's not even a face in this image and yet the image itself is incredibly sexy. Uh, the image of one of the women fixing a leaky pipe, that Xiu Shui Guan. And in the shot, you only see the pipe and her hand, but it's incredibly sexy because of the way that the film presents this image. So when we watch Bound, you can think about how the film portrays sexual desire. You can also think about the desire of the characters. What do they want in this situation? How do they use as women? How do they use their sexual appeal to men to manipulate these men into giving them what they want? How does their presentation as sexy women differ from the kind of people that they really are? And how does uh, their desire for other things, not sex, but other things uh, present itself through what the men think of as sexual desire. OK, questions about this film? OK, so let's take a 10 minute break and uh, you can begin watching the film at 1.50. Um, I will be on Teams here. If you have questions, I will answer them, uh, but I'm going to end the meeting. So if you, uh, well, I guess if you're not here, you can't you can't uh, hear me say uh, how to take attendance if you're not here. Yes, Mehui. 老师，那个就是呃，我我想问刚刚那个你讲那个新浪潮，你你有讲那个Doctor no, Doctor Strange is not a film noir. Uh, I'm thinking if there has ever been a Marvel movie that is a film noir. I can't think of one. There's been a, a TV show uh, recently starring Oscar Isaac called Moon Knight. Mm -hmm. That might uh, in some senses be considered a film noir, but it's a TV show. Movies, Thor the Dark World, uh, Thor 2 maybe. I don't, oh, um, in, uh, what was it? Um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the animated one. Uh, one of the characters is a, is a film noir Spider-Man, played or voice acted by Nicolas Cage. Uh, the movie itself is not a film noir, but his performance uses a lot of uh, film noir cliches or, or common tropes, common elements. I think that's it. But no, Doctor Strange is not a, a film noir. Okay. 
Thank you. Other questions? OK, so I'll be here if you have other questions. Let's take a break. Thank you.